Hello everyone, my name is Jim Clark and I'm here to, for, to teach a Sunday School lesson. If y'all were here, y'all probably be teaching me about the lesson. But it's the lesson for February 28th, it's lesson number 13. This February 30, uh, 28th is the second Sunday of Lent and our lesson today comes from the uh, adult Bible studies. And that, this quarter was about uh, the winter quarter, and it's about hope. <clears throat> Today's lesson uh, is Jesus clears the temple. And the focal passage, or the background text, is Matthew 21, 1 through 17. And if you'll give me a short time, uh, first we'll have a short prayer, and then I'll give a little bit of rundown on, on the background text. Uh, may we pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, I want to especially acclaim you as... Lord God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and the master that has your hand on us, and uh, if we're willing, let you guide us and direct us as, as you need us. Uh, we fall short of the mark in so many ways, Lord. We're, we're sinful by nature. We, we deal with it every day, every hour, every minute, Lord. But with your help, you can direct us to guide us to, to overcome sin, and be able to uh, move your kingdom forward. Lord, we'd like to give thanks for what you do for us by the, the perfect sacrifice that you made for us, for us to be able to, to move on, to be able to join you in, uh, in heaven. Lord, we, we know we're not perfect, but uh, we give thanks for the perfection that you provide through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your love, your grace, your glory, your guidance, your hand being upon us, being upon us. Lord, we have concerns today, and just a couple that come to mind is Sylvia Crump and uh, Doris Myers, that we ask that your hand be upon them, providing healing and uh, what it takes to, to make them whole again, Lord. Lord, I know there's other concerns each and every one of us have, whether it's uh, family, friends, uh, world situations, uh, Lord, we ask that your intervention be there to intervene and help us bring your kingdom forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As again, and I, uh, I'll repeat today's lessons about Jesus clears the temple. And the background text is Matthew 21, 1 through 17. And uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Jesus and the disciples are at uh, Beth Page at Mount, Mount Mount Olive, at the Mount of Olives, and Jesus tells two of his disciples going into the village and to find a donkey with her colt and to bring that colt to him. And they're also instructed, if anyone asks anything about it, you're to say that the master needs it. Well, the disciples did this. And they, uh, and they brought the, the colt, brought the donkey and the colt to the master. Uh, the disciples laid their coats uh, on the donkey and, and the colt. Uh, they did the, the laying on of, uh, and they also laid the uh, the people, the followers, and the people of the area laid their clothes and branches of palms in in the roadway for for Jesus and to to ride upon. Uh, the laying of coal, uh, clothes and uh, branches in Jesus' path recalls the way that kings entered into royal cities. Uh, they shouted Hosanna to the, and uh, to, and uh, to the son of David. Uh, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in an uproar, saying, "Who is this that that uh, crowds who were saying this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee?" This brings us to the focal page, 
focal passage, which is Matthew 21, 12 through, 12 through 16. And I'll read it from our uh, student book. And starting in verse 12, Then Jesus went into the temple and threw out all those who were selling and buying there. He pushed over the tables used for currency exchange and the chairs that were... Uh, and the chairs of those who sold doves. He said to them, It is written, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a hideout for crooks. People who are blind and lame came to Jesus in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the legal experts saw the amazing things he was doing, uh, doing and the children shining in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were angry. They said to Jesus, Do you hear what the children are saying? Yes, he answered. Haven't you ever read from the mouths of babes, babes and infants? You've arranged praise for yourself. And the key verse is, And Jesus said, said to them, It is written, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a hideout for crooks. Just a little bit on the commentary that... Um, that I have that uh, expounds a little bit on the, this passage. Uh, since Roman currency was a dollar, had idolatrous images on it, uh, uh, the temple would not accept it, so they had to use idol-free coins, which was available in Tyrrhenian currency. Money changers exchanged the, papal, the, the pagan coins for acceptable currency for a fee. <clears throat> Merchants said that sacrificial animals, uh, merchants sold sacrificial animals to those who had traveled long distances. Doves were sacrificed for, for poor pilgrims who could not afford lambs. Although the merchants and the money changers normally perform their tasks outside the temple uh, precincts, they occasionally set up shop in the court of the Gentiles. Uh, now, um, Verse 13, Jesus quotes, and it's, uh, and I have, I've written down, my house is a house of prayer. That's Jesus' quote is from Isaiah 56, 7 and Jeremiah 7, 11. Commotion in the, court, in the court made the temple unsuitable as a house of prayer. Zechariah 6, 12 through 13 foretold that the Messiah would purify the temple. And that, that's a uh, Zechariah 14, verse 21. In verse 14, that suggests that the first century uh, Jews extended the demands, and this is about uh, 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 there were people who were blind and lame come to Jesus in the temple and were healed, or they weren't allowed in, in the temple. And this comes from the first, uh, first century Jewish demands uh, from Leviticus uh, 21, 16 through 20 to exclude handicapped persons from entry into the temple. Uh, and again, that was in, it was in Leviticus. And really that was, uh, Moses told that to Aaron, that the priest could not be handicapped persons or, or blind persons or lame persons. Uh, the priest, let me emphasize that, and the priest later on, the one that extended this to all that uh, were of that affliction, whether handicapped or lame or blind, could not be in the temple. Uh, by healing the blind and lame, Jesus identified himself as Messiah, as the Messiah. By doing so and in the temple, he demonstrated that the handicapped were welcomed by a gracious God. In my, my commentary on verse 15 and six, 16, uh, this is about the children. Uh, both, the, both the wonders performed by Jesus and the words spoken by the children identified Jesus as the son of David and Messiah. Uh, Jesus argued, Psalms 8, 2, that the children's celebration was a, appropriate and divinely inspired. After all, Jesus had prepared praise for the mouth of infants. Uh, uh, our author, and I, I really like the author we had for this quarter, uh, uh, but he goes on and he, he tells a story about his wife and family and how, of, how often or, or irregularly 
would on maybe a Friday night. I'm sure your family would do this too on a Friday night, sit down and watch a movie. And he was learning how his wife and his daughter would uh, would prefer uh, love stories and, of course, the the stuff that men don't particularly care for. And he was more about action movies. But uh, he, he's making the point that in the lead up to the temple, we we get the idea that uh, Jesus is often talking about the birds and uh, the scenic and he's not really confrontational. Well, here he becomes confrontational. And our author, paraphrased him, has an action, uh, uh, a man of action or... Uh, uh, well, you get the idea of what the, what uh, in action movies, uh, but he makes a good point. And Arthur says, if one has the impression that Jesus was rather docile, compliant, passive, and that the that the behavior and the temper feels uncharacteristic, but Jesus was a prophet, even even as he is our Savior and God's Son, and and Jesus followed in the long tradition of the Old Testament prophets who resorted to radical action to drive people back to God. Well, you can't hardly mention a prophet that that you, all of them took what could be characterized as radical action. Uh, you know, Homer, Hos, Hosea married Gomer, and which was a radical action. Uh, Isaiah walked around barefoot and naked for three years as a sign of an omen against uh, Egypt. <clears throat> and there's numerous others that uh, uh, examples of prophets that take radical action, confrontational action. So when, so when Jesus didn't like what he saw in the temple court and desired to claim them of the money changers, he did so in a de de demonstrable way. That is, a, that there's little doubt that he wanted his action to be seen. Uh, we have no reason to think the money changers did not just set the, t set the tables right back up. And in other words, you know, Jesus came in and he could knock the table over and scatter the coins everywhere. But the, what was to keep the money changers going back and just sitting everything right back, back up and doing things as normal? We're, uh, we're left to surmise that the effort of Je Jesus' actions Jesus action was more symbolic than practical. What, but what a signal it was! So this was just the time that Jesus. So this was just not that time that Jesus got angry, and this was not just about the money changers. Jesus had a larger point to make, and our author. Uh, went on to expand its uh, what was the larger point. Uh, he, he, he titled it as uh, Economic Exorcism. And, uh, and some of the language that Jesus used would, uh, if you go to the original Greek, was the same words were used for an exorcism or casting out demons. Uh, it wasn't unusual for merchants to be located around the temple, selling animals for the sacrifices that were called for in, in Israel's law. It wasn't used for money changers to be in the outer courts of the Gentiles. They were necessary. Uh, but there's no evidence in the text that the money changers or the merchants were doing any, anything unscrupulous, such as scheming off the top or manipulating the exchange rate or selling pigeons or other animals of defect that were hidden. When Jesus said they had, that he made his house a hideout for crooks, den of, rob, den of robbers, he was quoting Isaiah. Uh, so Jesus wasn't attacking people who sold animal, animals and changing money. Uh, Besides, Jesus didn't just drive out the merchants and money changers. He threw out all those who were selling and buying there. If he were just going after the merchants and money changers, he would drive, he, he would drive out their customers too. Uh, 
again, the, the word that, uh, that's in the, the Greek that was used in Matthew, is, uh, the word was meant th throughout, uh, which meant demons and, uh, and other words used for exorcism. Uh, but Jesus threw out those buying and selling. Uh, Matthew tells us that people who were blind and lame came to Jesus in the temple and he healed them. Now, if you, if you didn't know better, you'd think that Jesus was just going back to his healing ministry, ministry as usual. But with his healing of the blind and the lame in the temple <clears throat> that made the chief priest and legal experts upset. This goes back to King David. And this uh, differs from a little bit of the commentary I read, but I, the author... Uh, I think he made a good point, and he says that this action goes back to King David. When King David and his ragtag rag army were out conquering Israel, one of the towns that they came to was up on a high hill and well fortified. And the, and the people of the town, the leaders of the town, saw it was just a, a ragtag army, the army you wouldn't think could overthrow their or or. Uh, get into their city and conquer them. Well, the people on the walls, the leaders said, we're just going to give our guards a rest. We're going to have the blind and the lame come here and, and guard the walls. Well, David and his, uh, and his army found uh, another entrance into the city, and they conquered the city. And uh, so, so David remembered this, how they ridiculed him and, and how the blind and lame ever ridiculed him. So David made a rule. No blind and lame would be welcome in, in the house in this new city. No reminders of these old insults. That city was Jerusalem. That house was not built after David's reign was over. That house was the temple. And that's how it came to be that the blind and the lame were prohibited from entering the uh, Jerusalem temple in Jesus' time. That's why Jesus' healing of the blind and the lame in the, in the temple <clears throat> was so radical and provocative. The people who had been kept out were now welcomed in and even healed. The new King Jesus was overturning just the, not just the tables, but the edict of King David. So that was a couple explanations for the for the keeping of the lame and the blind out. Which do you prefer? Well, to me, I prefer the latter explanation. They overthrew an edict of King David. Then the chief priests and the legal experts heard the children singing Jesus' praises. Uh, you can tell a lot about people about what makes them angry. In this case, they were, made, they were mad that the blind and the lame were healed. They were angry that the children were singing Jesus' praises. If you reflect back on that, what makes you angry? I don't know. When I read that, I had to examine myself about what makes me angry. And I'm like everybody else. I get angry from time to time, <laughs> depending on who you ask. But uh, there's reasons for what makes you angry. And you need to examine those issues. But now we're finally beginning to understand what made Jesus so angry in, in the temple courts. The sacrificial system and broke the, uh, and broke the rules because he is, he is the new temple. He claimed to reclaim the house. So our text for today is not so much about the temple as it is about Jesus. And I'm just going to read from... Uh, Student Handbook, uh, he makes a good point. It's the last five, five paragraphs of the, of the lesson, but it struck home to me. This story calls us to consider on this second Sunday of Lent that is there room in our hearts for those who have been excluded? Would we welcome the children singing Jesus' praises? This season of spiritual preparation for Easter is a time when we can pray that God reclaim the sacred space of our hearts. This is what happens when we repent. Prince, repentance means turning away from sin. When you repent, you let Jesus take over the temple, and, and that is your heart. 
Perhaps your art resembles a temple court where the transaction system of purchase and exchange. Maybe you come to God in prayer and you, and you would come to a, as if you come to a sales counter to pick up something or pick something out and haggle for a good price. But Jesus comes to turn over the tables. Other people might like to be the high priest, might be uh, like to be the high priest in their hearts. They've got an elaborate, neat system for how, for how life is supposed to work. They know who is welcome in their hearts and who is not. But here comes Jesus healing the lame and the blind, breaking the rules. But Jesus isn't just satisfied with claiming the temple. He is the temple. He is the one through whom we are reconciled to God. He is the Lord over our hearts our church, our world, and all creation. And our author asked the question, has Jesus cleaned up your heart or has he given you a new heart? Uh, I pondered that question for a while and I, in my opinion, both are acceptable that uh, if you cleaned your heart up or you're given a new heart. Let me close with a prayer that's in, in our lesson today. Lord Jesus, prophet, priest, and king in our hearts in a new way this season. Help us to repent all things that is not of God. Our Lord, our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.